that St. Patrick's, by the way, um, a Norman or medieval church built on a Hibernian Morse or early Irish site. Uh, so it's sometimes been imagined, and uh, Catherine actually addressed this when she talked about uh, Bronze Age beads imported into Ireland, it's sometimes been imagined that the Anglo Normans introduced, introduced international trade to Ireland after 1169. But it's really interesting that in the very first record of the conquest, Gerald of Wales uh, mentions that when Fitzgerald and his men attacked Wexford Town, they burned the ships in the harbour. And one of those is a vessel recently arrived from England with a cargo of wheat and of wine. So we know that before 1169, we are trading back and forth between the island of Ireland and Britain. And Gerald's own words are not the only evidence for that. At least two excavations in the town of Wexford have uncovered internationally sourced pottery, uh, and which is likely to predate 1169. Both of those sites were at South Main Street, excavated by Ed Burke and by myself, and they both contained fragments of Pathrath pottery, which were traded into Wexford from the German Rhineland, which is quite a long way away, before the arrival of the Anglo Normans. Um, but it is very true to say that the new association between Ireland and Norman Britain does intensify trade between <coughs> the two islands after 1169. Economic profiteering is, after all, the main motive for the Anglo Norman conquest of Ireland. And archaeological excavations throughout Wexford Town have shown that during the 13th and 14th century, 30 to 40 percent of the pottery in use in the town was imported into Ireland. And that's on the right hand side. This is some nice, deluxe, copper glazed imported pottery of the 13th and 14th century. And you can kind of see why people might have liked it. This is the local, very functional kitchenware which in some places predates the Anglo Norman Conquest, but really its productivity increases hugely after the Anglo Norman Conquest. Other pottery which has been imported into France in the 13th and 14th century, as well as coming from Britain, comes from Normandy, um, from Utrecht, from Flanders, and a lot of it is imported from southwestern Britain and from Bordeaux associated with the wine trade. Because obviously you're not going to drink French wine, you have to have a French glass to drink it out. So the big change in medieval urban settlement after 1169 is not what it looks like, but how common it becomes. And in 1169, the main towns in Ireland can be counted on one hand. We've got Dublin, we've got Wexford, we've got Waterford, we've got Cork, and we've got Limerick. And all of those towns have been founded by the Hoburn North settlements of Viking Raiders. Uh, we could add to that, of course, the proto-urban centres of Tom McNoy's, Glen de Lock, and the nucleated settlements uh, of prestige sites such as Ferns. Uh, but nonetheless, they are the place to be counted as towns in 12th century Ireland. But by the 14th century, County Wexford alone has more recorded urban settlements than all of pre-Norman Ireland. We've got firms developing from its early nucleated roots. If we move southwards to Zenescorthy, the new town of Ferry Carrick, there's Wexford, Tamon, Clamines, Banno, Great Island, and of course New Ross, which is founded in the early 13th century by the granddaughter of Dermot McMurray, Isabel de Clare, and her husband, William Marshall. And that's an imagined by Steve Dugan of New Ross in the 13th and 14th century. Uh, but all of these towns and settlements come complete with their own churches and parishes, um, like St. Mary's here in New Ross. Um, they're often dedicated to Anglo Norman saints, or the saints which are favoured by Anglo Norman settlers. They're Anne, Catherine, James, and Nicholas. And the establishment of all of these churches kind of leads to the understanding that the Normans first introduced parish system, a really crucial part of social fabric in Ireland. Um, and certainly the alleged Anarchy and antiquity of the pre Norman Church in Ireland is one of the reasons that Henry II's claims, uh, uh, one of Henry II's defences of his conquest of Ireland, and he's supported in that in the 1155 bull of Adrian IV. In reality, however, uh, this by the way is St. Nicholas of Myra on the left hand side, and if you look down here, there's a lovely 14th, 14th century medical church, church down outside the Compton on the right hand side. It's got beautiful Norman dedication, beautiful what we might think of as Anglo Norman architecture. And yet, if you look at the little circle around it, and if you look at some of the fragments of things like Belong Stones inside it, you realise this is a very established Irish uh, church site long before the arrival of the Anglo Normans. In reality, the parish system uh, seems to have been a development rather than a wholly new introduction of the uh, of the Anglo Normans. Um, there is a developing Irish diocesan, if not parish system, from at least 1111, when there's a synod at Brass Brass in and another one held in 1152. Um, so we know that the Irish are uh, developing their own organised parish or at least diocesan system. 
Uh, and similar changes were happening in the pre-Roman monastic system when innovators like Malachi of Armagh and indeed Dermot McMurray were bringing the continental orders to Ireland from the 1140s. And uh, this is an introduction which Angela Lee will uh, uh, expand upon in the next presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. But we can see, as regards continental <coughs> change, that in religion, just as part of the rural settlement, Norm and trade, the Normans were bringing an increase in existing practices rather than completely unique change. Um, but Ireland, of course, is more than the sum of its settlements. Um, it's largely an agricultural nation, and we know um, that one of the things the anti Normans do is change agricultural productivity in Ireland. Um, in the 12th and 13th century, the population of Ireland was growing strongly, and that population needed to be clothed and fed by a uh, developing system of feudal lordship. The condition of pre Norman agriculture in Ireland is often thought to be very basic, a few cattle around some ring forts. Um, and certainly the Anglo Normans developed a system of agricultural success in international trade, international trade, which increased throughout the thirteenth century. But it was happening before the thirteenth century as well. Um, we know uh, from uh, uh, historians like Cathy Swift, uh, she's pointed out that much of the wealth, wealth generated by John McMurrah in the pre-Norman era may have come from international sale of uh, the royal tributes that he's bringing in. Um, so he's getting tributes from his other kings, he's selling them into the international market, and it's that which he uses to finance his wars and his fine living and his construction programs here in Ireland. Um, this view is supported by Gerald Wells' remark um, that the Irish are pleased to send the hides of animals and skins and flocks of wild beasts abroad. Uh, so he's exporting directly out of the island. But Gerald kind of puts, sums that up with an early form of cultural stereotyping. Uh, when he notes that much of the returning cargo coming in in exchange for Irish produce is made up of vast quantities of wine. So much so um, that one would scarcely notice that grapes were not being cultivated on the island of Ireland. This is what trade looks like in the early and the Norman years. Uh, and again, with continuity, this lovely uh, stone, um, decorated stone from Selzburg, Selzburg Abbey in uh, Wexford, shows something that looks really very like a Viking ship. And that's the early 13th century Anglo-Norman vessel. Uh, by the 14th and into the 15th century, the vessels are getting much bigger. And this is an imagining of the port town of New Ross in the later 1300s because New Ross and Water have become increasingly more important as Wexford with its shallow harbour starts to be closed to larger medieval vessels. Now one significant change to the Irish countryside, which was rendered by the new anglo Norman style of agriculture, was a move away from pastoralism and uh, towards a greater use of tillage throughout the 13th century. Historical and archaeological investigations have shown that as much as 70% of the main land or land directly controlled by a lords of manors was farmed in Anglo Norman Ireland. That's a massive amount of land about the village, uh, when previously that we were mostly uh, herding cattle and sheep, of course. Um, so, what that does introduce to the countryside is a completely new structure the post windmill. We obviously have wheat and flour mills in Ireland in the pre Norman period, but they are generally driven by water. Uh, by the 13th and the 14th century, we are building these quite imposing. Uh, buildings in the landscape, which again, just to industrialise our agriculture. And that was reflected in County Wexford all the way into the 19th century and the 18th century when Wexford, <laughs> South Wexford in particular, has more windmills than any other part of Ireland outside of the Arts Peninsula and County Down. So we're always a very tillage area. So, to summarise, if urban and rural population, uh, international exchange, religious practices and even agricultural productivity were already in a process of change before 1169. What effect did the anglo norman conquest really have on Ireland? What did the Normans actually do for us, or indeed to us? Obviously, of course, all of these... Uh, uh, Maybe sort of that yeah. Obviously, of course, all of the above mentioned processes were quickened and developed and there's a huge influx of new people coming into the Irish colony. Residents in the new towns of New Ross and Clamines were French, um, English and Welsh speakers. And they had names like Stafford, Roach, Cod, Furlong, Sutton and Brown. Names which are still common in Wexford today and uh, which uh, went on to become the principal landholders of Wexford and indeed Southeastern Ireland throughout the medieval period. 
In South Wexford in particular, the impact of these newcomers was so intense uh, that the entirely new language or dialect of Yola developed in South County Wexford in the bar baronies of Forth and Bargy. So perhaps, for the ordinary Irish resident, the peasant farmer of Ferns or the fisherman of Wexford, uh, the greatest change came not in the material culture, not in the architecture, not even in the social practices of everyday life, but in the organisation of hierarchical society. The bequeathing of Leinster to Strongbow in 1171 was an entirely new concept in Irish inheritance. And it's perhaps one which Dermot McBurray never truly envisaged happening. Because Dermot obviously considered himself a young active man when he died in his early 60s here in Ferns in 1171. Uh, that control of Wexford, control of Leinster by Strongbow was certainly not something which the later McMurray cabinets or the then High King Rory O'Connor and his Irish peers were willing to accept. And it resulted in an 1171 counter offensive against Strongbow, which saw him besieged in Dublin by Rory O'Connor and a rather improbable 30,000 Irish troops recorded by Geraldus Cambrensis. But O'Connor's forces were defeated at Dublin. And the visit of Henry II to Ireland in 1171, followed by O'Connor's signing of the Treaty of Windsor in 1175, when he in essence agreed to become a sub-king of Henry II, and he agreed to let Henry II, Henry II and his Norman lords control Leinster, um, but leaving the rest of Ireland to the Irish under Rory O'Connor. Uh, that treaty obviously totally didn't work possibly because Henry II had no interest in it working, or because he couldn't control his anti Norman knights in Ireland anyway. And that treaty and the visit of Henry II sealed the fate of the Inster Irish culture. <coughs> Under the feudal system of primogeniture, the inheritance of Leinster fell to Strongbow's daughter, Isabel, who was, of course, Dermot McMurray's grandmother, and to her husband, William Marshall, and then in succession throughout the first half of the 12th century to their five sons. Eventually, the Norman lords of Leinster as substantially decreed to Strongbow by Dermot McCarthy, was inherited by the husbands and sons of the Marshall's daughters. And that led to a partition of this province in 1247. The lordship, the Norman lordship of Leinster, uh, the previous Irish kingdom of Leinster, uh, once with capital here at Farms, was gone forever.